Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. We're all eager to get the show on the road, um, so I'll keep this brief. My name is Chris Finan. I'm the executive director of the National Coalition Against Censorship. If you're not familiar with our work, uh, NCAC is a censorship first responder. We intervene directly in censorship cases, particularly those involving students and artists. For almost 50 years, NCAC has maintained a nonpartisan position. We believe that free expression is both a fundamental human right and a vehicle for achieving a just and inclusive democracy. As leaders in thinking about free speech, we understand the importance of conversations about the difficult issues that challenge our deepest beliefs, which is what brings us here. Uh, first, a commercial. Um, now more than ever, it's important to support the free and open discussion of ideas. Help us to continue to host events like this by making a gift to NCAC. You can visit ncac.org to donate today. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our moderator, Emily Knox, who is a longtime member of the board of NCAC. Emily is an associate professor in the School of Information Sciences at the University of Illinois. She researches and teaches about intellectual freedom, information access, information ethics, reading practices, and a lot of other things. She is also on the board of Beta Phi Mu. Emily, I'm handing to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Chris, and thanks to NCAC for hosting this extremely timely conversation. There's been quite a bit of media coverage lately over the perception that liberals are abandoning free speech. That instead of the traditional position that free speech enables social progress, people are now pitting free speech and social justice on opposing sides of cultural debate. Of course, nothing is quite sim that simple or binary. Today, we're going to take a look at whether we've gone too far in protecting free speech, whether in 2021, a staunch defense of the principle of free expression is still the cornerstone of democracy we always thought it was. I'm joined by Martin Garbus and Randall Kennedy. Martin Garbus is a litigator with decades of experience in First Amendment cases. He has taught at Yale Law School and Columbia Law School. His clients have included Lenny Bruce, Spike Lee, Penguin Boot Books, and America's longest jailed journalist, Josh Wolf. He has argued before the Supreme Court, as well as courts across the US in over 100 cases. And this is only the briefest possible summary of his experience. Randall Kennedy is the Michael R. Klein Professor at Harvard Law School. He served as a law clerk for Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall and received the Robert F. Kennedy Book Award for his book, Race, Crime, and the Law. He's also written widely on the use and history of the N-word. He also serves with me on the NCAC Board of Directors. Thank you both for joining us today. There's a lot to cover, but let's start here. Have we gone too far in protecting free speech? Well, my response to that is an emphatic, no, we have not gone too far in protecting freedom of speech. And indeed, in my view, uh, it, it's hard to imagine going uh, too far. The, uh, the enemies of free expression are so omnipresent that frankly, I, I, don't, I don't think that people who are champions of free speech need to worry actually a whole lot about you know, inhibiting themselves. The world will put limits on freedom of expression and it does and we see it uh, day by day by day. I mean, you just, you know, just read the newspapers on, on, from the right, you have this, uh, this campaign uh, to chill uh, teaching chill expression, sort of the new, you know, boogeyman, you know, critical race theory, anything having to do with people who were championing racial justice are being viewed as, uh, 
you know, as indoctrinators, as enemies of American uh, patriotism. And so there are, you know, there are all sorts of moves afoot uh, to, to, to chill the air on that front. Um, on the left end of things, you have a whole series, you know, every, every week there's some teacher who is being disciplined, sometimes even being fired uh, at every level from high school on up to colleges for, you know, merely quoting uh, texts or merely, um, me merely quoting, you know, using the, so, you know, the, the N word is being viewed as a fireable offense, just quoting. And um, so again, we have a, people who are champions of freedom of expression have a lot of work to do. They have uh, adversaries on every side. And so in my view, no, we have not gone too far. Uh, to the contrary, uh, we haven't gone far enough. And so I'll, I'll stop there. I don't wanna filibuster. Martin, what do you think? Let me express my concerns. I don't know that I wind up differently, but I think that I grew up, uh, I represented Nazis, I represented racists, I represented some of the worst people, Shockley, Nobel Prize winner. Uh, I think that we all were brought up on the idea of American exceptionalism the whole idea of free speech, our constitution being so different than any other place in the world. And we grew up to believe the same exceptionalism led us, many of us or many people to think that racial problems ended when the civil war ended. And I think that we are now at a different time. And I think this different time requires a certain kind of consideration. I think that free speech is in the service of democracy. It's in the service of having voters informed. Uh, I had a wonderful conversation, I'll drop a name, with Andrei Sakharov in Russia many years ago when he talked about free speech and creativity, which allowed America to make advances in science that the Russians could not make. And he talked about the way the Manhattan Project developed. What I see now in the country is a country where a substantial portion, maybe a majority, is anti-democratic. I see, and I, what I see now in the country, it's hard to say I see it for the first time, but I see what I see now. And I see that you may well have a Trump house in, 20, uh, in, in, in the next election, you may have a Trump Senate in the next election. We have just seen the extent in these last few days of the Trump involvement in the Department of Justice, things that were inconceivable to us. Uh, we also now live not in the days of Holmes and Brandeis when we talked about the marketplace of ideas and that good speech will outweigh bad speech. I don't believe that to be true. I think that the concepts on which we believe, many of the concepts on which we thought free speech rested on are no longer accurate. So I don't know how you deal with, let's say somebody in Ohio giving a speech, whether it be on a rally or something else or on a, on a, a, a site that that triggers murder or mayhem in South Africa or in India. So the world in which we live in today, it seems to me is, is a very different world or potentially a different world. I remember Cho and Lai's expression or he, he has a meeting with Kissinger back in 1970 in China and Kissinger says to Cho and Lai, what do you think of the French Revolution, the effect of the trench, French Revolution? And Cho and Lai says, it's too early to tell. I think that we are at a transitional point in the country. And I'm not clear, I will no longer represent 
the kinds of people I represented in the past. I'm speaking for myself and I'm not speaking in black and white terms. I'm not saying everybody, but I understand that over the years, as I represented Nazis, racists, that I helped them build organizations, that they, I, we, we would go out of court and we would be big winners and they were patriots. Uh, I recognize that these are, as I say, complicated times. And I would not do today what I did then, which is not to say that the ACLU shouldn't or that other people shouldn't. I'm talking about where I put my passions and my time. And to the extent that that's a reflection of other people who did my kind of business, that becomes a very personal thing. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I think I wind up the horrors of government censorship backed by law enforcement, backed by the power of government is extraordinary. But we have never seen, I don't think, as clearly as we do now, the power of money to control the media and the internet. I think everything I say relates to time and place. And to suggest that we make a dramatic change because of something I perceive that exists now is difficult for me and difficult for all of us. I could talk forever, but I'll stop. Let me pick up on your, your first point. You, you, you express your anxiety about the moment that we're in. And I share that, that anxiety. I have never felt more trepidation in my life. I think that we are in a, a very perilous moment. I think that where we differ though is, you know, what do we take from that? I take from that the a, a, a sort of a more, there's, there's more urgency in me now than ever before to defend and extend the boundaries of freedom of expression precisely because of the dangers, including the authoritarian dangers uh, that surround us. I mean, what are we going to do? How are we going to turn things around? It seems to me that, you know, uh, we're going to turn things around through changing public opinion. And to change public opinion, we're going to have to have people who have, you know, who, who can speak, who have avenues to speak. We have to keep the walls of, 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 you know, suppression away. And um, so, I mean, that's, that's what I take from your initial point about this being a, you know, a particularly precarious moment. I agree with you. I can think of nothing worse than governmental censorship, the power of governmental censorship, backed up by law enforcement, locking up people who speak badly. We all live through, the, well, I lived through the McCarthy period. I was very young. And we know that if you stop this kind of speech, you can stop any kind of speech. Mm -hmm. So that we know that Nadine's book, for example, which talks about uh, give hate speech more room. And, and I'm sympathetic to what you say. Uh, I'm not sure, frankly. I mean, I, I, I have believed all my life in the religion of the First Amendment. I practiced in the Warren Court. I had First Amendment, uh, it was my case, we struck down criminal libel laws, other things. Uh, I remember in the obscenity cases when after the Supreme Court tried to define it, define it, define it, they said, we give up, let it go, whatever it is. And that was, I think, the appropriate decision. And one can argue that that kind of logic applies here, but we never face the problem, for example, of a guy in Ohio saying something either in a speech or on the net that led to killings in India. I don't know how you deal with that. I don't think that we, I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, 
Nadine Strawson and her book on hate speech. And I think it's a wonderful book. And one of the things that's really, as far as I'm concerned, so powerful is when she's, she, you know, she's very pragmatic. She says, okay, let's take a look around the world and let's take a look at other places that actually do regulate so-called hate speech. How are they faring? Is it the, is it the case that you know, putting limits on so-called hate speech actually uh, diminishes the uh, you know the 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 anti-Semites, you know, diminishes the racists. She showed over and over and again where it just as a pragmatic calculation, no, it made martyrs of these people. It didn't stop the killings. So I think we have to be you know pragmatic about this and. I want to say just two things, picking up again from your, your last comment. One, you talked about, you know, McCarthyism. You know, think about these laws that are going, that are being passed, again, seems like every week with, you know, uh, trying to put limitations, trying to put a chill in the air with respect to discussion about racial justice. Think about what's going on at the uh, University of North Carolina and the refusal to, to tenure uh, the, the, the journalist. Um, you don't have to be a fan, you know, you don't have to support every thing that, you know, critical race theory, people who call themselves critical race theory people say, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to embrace them to be very concerned about this obvious effort to um, put a chill in the air with respect to public education. And it seems to me it should invoke you know, the, the, the specter of what was going on in the, the 1950s vis-a-vis -vis, uh, you know, pinks and, and, and so-called um, uh, reds. Second of all, you, you mentioned, um, you know, you mentioned the law. And here's one thing that is very much on my mind. So I think that ultimately this is going to be about changing public opinion, getting public opinion on our side. I'm a lawyer. I think that lawyer folks and, you know, tend to, 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 to be overly legalistic in these discussions. You know, they're talking to a group of people and the immediate thing to do is, you know, the First Amendment. You know, I, I, First Amendment's fine. And, 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 and you know, I'm, I, I like the First Amendment, you know, for the most part. But remember, as a practical matter, the First Amendment, the boundaries drawn by the First Amendment are boundaries drawn by a group of judges. Well, you know, sometimes they draw the boundaries in a good way, but sometimes they draw them in a bad way. Uh, when I'm talking to people, I'm trying to push myself. And Martin, I'd be very interested in your view about this. I, I try actually not to lead off with a legalistic argument at all. I try to say, listen, I think you ought to be for this or against this because this is wise, because this is good, is because this is going to conduce to making a better society. Now, you know, later in the discussion, we can talk about the, you know, where the Supreme Court's First Amendment jurisprudence is. But I don't actually think that that, where the Supreme Court's First Amendment jurisprudence is, I don't think that should be the lead off hitter. I think that policy, I think that what's wise, what's good for the society. And last, and in, is an illustration of that, the law is not going to be our savior with respect, for instance, to this whole issue of um, regulating uh, curricula in primary and secondary schools. The law is not going to be very helpful to freedom of speech people there. 
Why? Because as a general matter, a tremendous deference is given to localities in, uh, in controlling public education. Uh, it's, it's viewed as perfectly proper, perfectly good for the public schools to inculcate patriotism as local authorities see fit. Well, you know, against that backdrop, I don't think the law is going to be very helpful to us with what's going on now. I think what's going to be helpful to us is getting the hearts and minds of the American public and that is where it seems to me we should, you know, we should, we should, we should focus our attention and uh, develop our argumentative chops. I agree with you. Uh, I think the law plays a very small role. But as I look upon the country, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to go into Weimar analogies and all that stuff. As as I look at the country now, and I look at democratic principles issues like voting rights, issues like racial matters. I look upon these things as the cornerstone of a democracy. It's the, you know, we, we tend to think it's the first amendment or some people, therefore it's the most important of all the amendments. Uh, one could argue as they do in other countries, a right to life, a right not to be sick. There are other rights of great substance. But when I look at the very strong possibility that and I, I'm not blaming speech for it, but rather it is a country now on the cusp and it may never recur. And I don't want to be you know, yelling fire to use a strange analogy, but it's, it, it, you may have a majority of the country, you may have a president that does not believe in democratic principles. The first amendment is a key to democratic principles. And I can see that those democratic principles, I believe maybe more in voting rights, more in equal justice, it's a hard discussion, than in the abstract beauty of free speech. We didn't really have free speech, as you know, fundamentally in America until, until you know, the middle of the last century. Ellis Coase has written a wonderful book called The Short Life and Death of the First Amendment talking about really what a short period of time we have had it. And then, and then the, the Warren court gave us what they gave us. And then since then, you've had all these other courts pretty much cutting so many things back. So to me, I'm concerned with democratic principles. And I say, how do you best foster democratic principles? And I'm concerned. I think that we never had situations in the world, in, that we had before. We never had the kind of money and power now that really determines speech so much. Plus, the, as I say, the far reaching effect. So I don't have an answer. I don't say stop doing this, but I think it's a different, a different, one has to look at it differently. I don't know that I wind up any place different than where you are. I know for myself and my own passions, I would rather not put my time defending the Nazis, the Shockleys, et cetera. I think that, that I, as a lawyer with a certain degree of skills, if I have a commitment to certain democratic principles, I should be doing something else. And I'm just speaking for myself. Yeah, th th there's always going to be the difficulty. So there was that interesting piece you know, in the New York Times a couple of days ago about the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, there's always going to be the, uh, the, the, in a sense, you know, the, the, the question of how one allocates one's resources. You only have, you know, you're, you know, there are only 24 hours in a day. You only have a certain amount of work time. There's only a certain amount of money. There's only a certain amount of, you know, energy that you can spend. And so you've got to make your, you know, you've got to make difficult decisions about where you allocate uh, your energies. And, you know, those are going to be difficult decisions. And there's always going to be the problem of weighing. There's always going to be the problem of different important commitments, sometimes, you know, creating friction. Not everything is going to run down the track, you know, straight ahead. 
But I repeat that um, precisely because we are where we are, having anxieties like we've never had before about the state of our democracy, it's precisely because of that, it seems to me, that we, we need almost a redoubled embrace of certain fundamental propositions. I, I, I encounter this in my, uh, you know, in, in, in class. So, I, you know, my, I, I'm on a campus. I teach at Harvard Law School. I, I bump into students. And, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned your own career and, you know, the, the struggles you had as a lawyer in the 1960s. One of the difficulties with a lot of, you know, young people, a lot of young people, the 1960s, they thought that that's when the dinosaur roamed. Really, truly. I mean, they, they think that, that we're taught, you might as well be talking about the 13th century. And a lot of them, they have, they have grown up and they are, a lot of young people are, um, they're used to having certain rights. They don't know that it was relatively recently after tremendous struggles. It wasn't until the 1960s that um, students in public schooling had any rights. And I'm talking about public uh, uh, colleges and universities. In a public college or university in 1960, if you said something about, you know, if you criticize the president of the college or, or the president of the United States, they could throw you out. And there was no recourse whatsoever. That's 1960. It's a very recent thing, but young people have sort of grown up sort of relying upon this sort of unconsciously. And I think that there is a considerable amount of complacency out there. And the complacency shows itself when you, you, know, you confront a student and the student demands that uh, the you know that that officialdom at a, a at a at a college or university take action against another student or let's say a teacher because the stu because the student or teacher has said something that is quote offensive and then you start to talk with the student who's complaining and you say gosh well you know if 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 you were to if we were to go down that avenue where would it end? And frankly, a lot of folks haven't even thought much about it because they've grown up complacently thinking that, uh, you know, sort of enjoying rights, but not having been taught about the struggles to get these rights. And so, again, Martin, I think we are in a very precarious moment, but that the thing to do is to, uh, you know, more speech, more teaching, and, you know, let's put it all out on the table and uh, try to figure out ways to bring more people over to our side, because you're right. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, I, I start off by saying it's hard to imagine going too far. I started off by talking about the enemies of freedom of expression. Not only do we have to worry about the enemies of freedom of expression, but we also have to worry about the, you know, sort of the indifferent bystanders. In fact, that might be an even at least as big a problem. And what we need to do is to make a public appeal and try to bring home to people the importance, the extraordinary, you know, the, 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 the absolute importance of people being able to speak their minds. Even when I don't like, you know, people saying stuff, I don't like it, I disagree with it, but the importance of people being able to express themselves, the importance of people able to listen, 
You know, the audi audience rights, very important. We often talk about just speakers rights, audience rights. All of that, it seems to me, we need to make more vivid. And, you know, we have a nice group here. I'd be interested in hearing from folks. We have all sorts of folks who have experience in this realm. How can we make more vivid the necessity of people being able to speak and people being able to hear? I think part of the question that people have is, what does that mean in our current context for communication? So in a world where we have social media, where we have uh, entities like Facebook and Twitter that have so much say over the public discourse, what does it mean to have free speech in those contexts? And what, are, what would be the correct responses um, when there are terrible things that people say on those particular um, platforms. Mm -hmm. Randall, go ahead. Go to it, Martin. It's a great <laughs> question. We're passing the buck. <laughs> I, was, I was leaving it to you. I was leaving it to you. Go ahead. I think, um, Emily, that the would you, you, you've put your finger on a very difficult and pressing issue, which is the problem of the, the, the problem, and it is a problem, I think, of private power. Um, you know, again, uh, in my socialization, uh, socialized as a, as a lawyer, you know, you, you know, First Amendment, First Amendment, of course, only is triggered uh, if a government is doing something whether it be local, whether it be state, whether it be the, you know, federal. But what you've just put your finger on is, well, what about, what about private entities that are you know, so powerful? You know, the Twitters, the Facebooks, or uh, the publishers. So you know, just in the past couple of weeks, very interesting, this, this whole thing with, um, I guess it was yeah, uh, W. W. Norton and Company. You have uh, somebody who publishes a book, uh, the biography of uh, Philip Roth, and then uh, the publisher, you know, their their facts about the the author of the book that come to light. The publisher says, "Oh gosh, we don't want to be associated with this person anymore." We are going to stop publication. We're gonna, you know, we, you know, we're out. We're, you know, we're throwing this guy out. You know, what about the power of publishers? Publishers are very powerful. What do we do about them? I'm not altogether sure. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to pretend. Uh, I, I read uh, a lot about this. I'm trying to get, you know, sort of guidance and try to, you know, trying to find my own footing. I'm not altogether sure. I think we have to be extremely careful because for me, it's still the case that big brother, namely government, for me is still, you know, the biggest problem. And so um, as between private entities that have a lot of power as opposed to the government, you know, to keep big brother in check, I'll take, I'll take the private entities. Uh, I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, public opinion can be mobilized in various ways to limit overweening private power. And so I still see government as the, the main problem. But, uh, you know, the, the, the problem you pose uh, is a good one. And let me add to that, that, you know, it's not only the, the problem of, you know, the government versus private parties, but there's also another, you know, another layer of difficulty. What about the rights of these private powers? So, you know, you have a book, book publisher and, you know, maybe the book publisher, you know, two years ago was publishing a book or said it was going to publish a book. 
And then people in the publishing house say, you know what? We don't want to put our muscle and our prestige and our energies behind this book that's propagating these, you know, terrible ideas. Forget it. We don't, you know, that we, we, we have our own aesthetic or, you know, ideological commitments. And in, in, in respect of those commitments, no, we don't want to be associated with this sort of author. Well, you know, don't private entities have, uh, you know, ha have, have, you know, rights to freedom of expression as well. So it's a tough problem. Let, let me respond to that to some extent. I represented the publisher years ago when Albert Speer did his book. He, he wrote, uh, he, he was one of the architects of the uh, Holocaust, the fascism. And he wrote this memoir uh, written in Spandau prison where he was for 20 years. And there was enormous pressure on the publishers not to publish the book. Uh, I represented the publishers and we tried very hard to get the book published. I think years ago with Rushdie again, I represented the publisher mm -hmm. and there was enormous pressure uh, for a slightly different reason. People were getting hurt because of the Rushdie book. The Penguin offices were surrounded by police and a translator of his was killed. And there were allegedly stores blown up or fires in Penguin stores in England. And the question is, how do you deal with it? And the publisher there tried to deal with it in its own way. They felt that they should get a consortium to publish the paperback. So it didn't come out under the name of Penguin, but rather it came out under the name of somebody else. I think that publishers should not pull backs as Norton did. I had a little piece not so long ago. Um, uh, on the other hand, I think that if people in a publishing house don't want to be associated with a particular book, that then becomes an economic issue in the, in the Roth book. Uh, and, 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 and as I said, Roth is a dear friend of mine, but in the Roth book, Norton did what they did. And then the marketplace is finding another publisher to do the paperback. So the paperback will come out June 29th. So I am sympathetic to people within a publishing house that don't want to publish something. I think arbitrary actions by publishing houses that are determined by money uh, is a very serious problem. I think that we really haven't dealt with, and maybe we can't, and that, that's the problem that I feel. You and I both agree that government suppression is awful, that the vast sum of money and power comes from the government, plus the fact that they have criminal enforcement, DOJ, et cetera, to prosecute as the, they did during the McCarthy period, as they did when you had this battle over obscenity cases. The question is, it seems to me, which is you, some of these questions are unique that, that you know, you and I were brought up, I, hate, I don't want to cite law, the Brandenburg case. Mm -hmm. You and I were brought up with the idea that uh, you have to look at the effect of that speech, what will happen to that speech. And over the years, the courts have tried to develop a whole series of standards. But what are the standards now? I'm not saying I have an answer. What are the standards now when we know that a website in the middle of the country can, we can protect its speech, but it's, it then could lead to something horrible overseas or something in Ohio can lead to something horrible in Florida. I think that's a new reality. Does that reality change all of our views? I think also, you know, we talk about First Amendment rights and you and I, at least I was brought up, the First Amendment is the First Amendment because it's first. It hasn't always been that way. And to me, voting rights might be first. To me, equal justice might be first. And I don't have an easy way of dealing with it. I just don't. I don't have an easy way of dealing with it either, but you know, you brought up these nightmarish scenarios and we've seen nightmarish scenarios. I mean, you know, Charlie Hebdo, for goodness sakes. Yeah. Um, that they, they are there. And because we live, you know, because of changes in technology, that's right. Uh, communications is much quicker, much, you know, it's, it's, it, 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 
it's it's everywhere. It's a, it, we, we do live in a different world, but there are certain ideas, it seems to me, that, um, or, or, or certain tenets that are longstanding and that we should recall. And one is, you know, we, we ought not give in to the, you know, intimidation. I mean, we, we, we simply, you know, um, if, 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 we, if, if we start giving in to that, things will go down quickly. Can I just interrupt, and, which I haven't done? Yeah, before. go ahead. No, please do. You say giving in to intimidation. And I agree 100%. You know, again, we learned that from the McCarthy period. Once you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. But then there's reality. And it seems to me the reality in this country today, it's not another country. We don't have to write articles about how it looks like this country or that country. But in this country today, what does all this, not does all this, but what are, what are our true values? Mm -hmm. And as I said to me, if I have a distinction to make between voting rights and speech, if that's the issue, and it doesn't have to be, but if you see it that way, or if I have to make a distinction between, let's call it equal justice, or the right to life, or the right to a guaranteed minimum income, how do I feel about that, those values as compared to the very profound commitment you and I and so many others have to the First Amendment? I think that you're, I think that you are, um, you know, are there tensions? Yes, there are sometimes tensions. You have, you know, in a society, large society, complicated society, there's lots of different missions going on at the same time. There's various commitments at the same time. Sometimes there's gonna be tensions. Sometimes there's gonna be contradictions. But generally speaking, you've, 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 you've raised the, the question of, you know, sort of social justice a number of times in your remarks. Generally speaking, in American history, the, 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 the forces of freedom of expression and the forces of social justice, whether we're talking about racial social justice, whether it's gender, whether it's sexual orientation, generally speaking, those camps have marched in the same direction. And I, and I, I think there's a, there's a reason for that. And I think nowadays, sometimes there, there's that, 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 that overall, I don't know, sort of community of, 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 of aspiration, um, the, the, that there is an overall community of aspiration there, I don't think is, is, is being appreciated enough. You mentioned Brandenburg. You mentioned Brandenburg. So there's the case, you know, Ohio case, you know, some a Ku Klux Klansman is prosecuted under a state law uh, because the, you know, the, the state criminalized uh, you know, you know, advocating the overthrow of the government or something, and, and he's prosecuted. And the uh, Supreme Court of the United States uh, uh, reverses, you know, invalidates the, the, the conviction, saying that in order to prosecute somebody under, you know, you've, you've got to show not only that they were just advocating overthrow of the government, but there had to be you know, there had to be, an, you know, in a, it had to be with Im immediate, there had to be incitement, there had to be a probability of, 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 of action, just mere, you know, advocacy in and of itself that's protected by the First Amendment. You know, here's one of the difficulties that we face. In some law schools in the United States today, right as we speak, there are teachers who have to be very careful 
in their teaching of Brandenburg because the subject of the prosecution when he made his speech used language which is quoted by the, you know, by the jurist that decided the case. But if a teacher quotes the language, there will be some students who complain and say, this is, you know, this is traumatizing me. And there will be authorities who will then lean on or maybe even punish the teacher. Now, frankly, for me, I think this is easy. I don't think, you know, I don't, I don't, it, this should be easy. This should not even be part of, it should not even sort of be in the discussion because it's so easy. But unfortunately, it's out there. And this is the sort of thing that we need to uh, address and address very strongly. And we need to say to students and teachers and, fr and frankly, anybody else, listen, in order to come to grips with reality, the realities we face, we have to be open and we have to be candid and we have to be unafraid of the truth. Even ugly truths, even ugliness, we have to be unafraid. And we have to be willing to allow for freedom of expression, freedom of listening, freedom of teaching. That's, it seems to me, where we are. And um, I, it seems to me this, this, my last few sentences are the, you know, the message that we all need to be putting out there. Emily? So I think the question is, um, Randall said that at one point it was seen that uh, freedom of expression and social justice were moving in the same direction. What has happened where those perceptions are not seem to be moving in the same direction? When I teach my students um, I will say quite plainly that many of them believe that hate speech should be illegal. Um, I often push this on this by saying things like, how do you define hate speech? Mm -hmm. Who will be defining hate speech? Do you trust our current Supreme Court to make those definitions? Um, but they are very focused on the issues of harm and who is hurt by free speech and what sort of ideas are just circulating in general and what the basic outcomes are from, the, from hate speech. So I think the question is really, I'm sort of, there's not really a question, it's more, well, what comes next? Mm -hmm. So if it seems that what we are doing right now is not necessarily <clears throat> the best thing for everyone, for the country to be more equitable. Um, what sort of regime should we, look, we be looking at? What sort of policies should we be looking at? Um, or is does it make sense for us to just keep going and see what happens? I think that's really where um, a lot of the questions that I see coming in are about, and um, I think is the big question for me. I have my own feelings about it, but I think it's it'd be good for um, to hear both of you respond to that. Let me just make a small point before Randall starts. The whole concept of free speech, we talked about the Brandenburg case, was that somebody could say something in front of an audience and this, this related to Skokie, this relates to Charlottesville. The assumption was that you would have an independent police force or governing force that would protect the people who could be hurt by that speech. And that was basically, I don't want to elevate that into more than it is. It was just a reality that you could have bad speech, but that the police would stop a Charlottesville. And I was in favor of Skokie. I spoke out on behalf of the Nazis. And in Skokie, the police did that. 
It was a peaceful demonstration. We now have questions about that and, and the ability and the commitment of law enforcement, certain kinds of people in law enforcement in these days. I'm not saying that these, this collection of small facts should wipe out great principles, but I am saying that we have to be aware and, 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 and Randall certainly is aware of what has changed. Mm -hmm. And I, I recognize the beauty of free speech. I recognize the whole idea of the, the primacy of the First Amendment. It's a nobility. Uh, but uh, again, the question is whether or not, uh, given where we are today, requires not so much the suppression of free speech, but let's say control about money influencing the media, the way that the media through either uh, newspaper buying, which, which, which you know, they, they own, the large money's owning mo um, newspaper houses or the large money's determining what goes on the internet based on how many people you sell to buy your product. I think we've never had that before in this way. Now you can argue, otherwise you can say, well, look back, et cetera, et cetera. It hasn't changed. I think it's changed. And I think the fact that, I don't want to repeat myself, that you have a large disenchantment with democracy in the United States. And all that concerns me. Yeah. I'm not throw out the baby with the bathwater, but I'm saying we have to do something more. I don't know what the more is. Um, your comment about the police seems to me to be a really excellent comment that shows or sh the, the freedom of expression is dependent upon lots of things. It's dependent upon an overall environment. Uh, you know, freedom of expression, for instance, you know, we, we, we depend on just basic knowledge. I mean, frankly, if people can't, you know, if people can't read or write, if people are just completely, you know, ignorant, uh, there is going to be a diminution in all that we're talking about. We depend upon certain things that we often don't think about. Police protection. You know, there's been a lot of talk about the police. There have been, you know, people, for instance, who've, you know, talked about, you know, abolish the police and, you know, defund the police and such. But, you know, take a look at what you just said. That's right. Uh, one of the things that actually we depend upon is we depend upon police protection. So if some, you know, person wants to go to the pu public park and with a chair and stand on the chair, and make a speech in favor of some proposition. And then people are gathering around and, you know, muttering and saying, gosh, you know, we wish this guy would shut up. What do we do? We depend on the police to protect the speaker. We don't, we don't, we don't think about the police in that way very often, but actually we, you know, frankly, we ought to. And to the degree that police do not protect the speaker, we should be concerned and we should, you know, demand that the police suitably uh, protect uh, the speaker. So, you know, freedom of expression, freedom of learning, freedom of listening is dependent upon a whole bunch of things, uh, you know, some of which we, you know, take for granted and, you know, and, and, and don't think about enough. Um, Emily, I want to go back to your scenario. Because I thought it was an excellent scenario. You know, what do, what do we do? In my view, with a, a, the, the student asks, it's, it seems to me, or you, you ask some really good questions. I think a wonderful class could be generated from the questions that you put in the mouth of the student. And you answered them, and you you know you put it you put you 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 made them questions, and it seems to me that we are in good shape 
so long as we can create an environment that allows the posing of the questions and that allows an answering of the questions in a pluralistic system. So you, you know, yeah, hate speech, hate speech. People, what is that actually? You know, what, what, what's hate speech to you? What's hate speech to you? What's hate speech to you? Randy, you know, how, j- just suppose, just suppose somebody says that such and such is hate speech, but actually that's, that's not hate speech as far as you're concerned. Actually, you embrace that speech. How do we tell what's hate speech, what's not that? Randall, let, class. Randall let me rudely interrupt you for a second. So I, I have said, and it, you know, w- that let's say the anti-democratic forces at the, this moment, and we realize that's, that's not an uncomplicated word and what we mean by it, or let's say X percent. Let's assume that you have a change in politics and you soon have what I would call anti-democratic forces, let's say, people who want to get rid of voting rights, get rid of other things. Let's assume that becomes 75% and 80% of the population. Okay. And let's assume that that opens the floodgates to more and more hate speech. I recognize the terror, the terror of government coming in and making decisions. But I'm troubled by that principle and that possible scenario. Under, let's take your scenario. Um, how is it that retreating from free speech, speech principles is going to help us with that scenario? I mean, that, that's what I, that's the sort of the disconnect. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm afraid too. I'm appalled too that there are so many people who are obviously, you know, not all that concerned about the Dane, you know, about threats to freedom of expression, threats to, you know, voting rights, threats to, you know, a variety of things that I think are imperative for a good society. But how does, how does, how does backing off of free speech principles help with that? It could, well, that becomes a whole other discussion. In other words, it could be that the worst of speech might drive that 65% to 90%, but that's just conjecture. I understand that. Uh, And it's based on my feeling, just seeing certain of what I perceive to be tendencies. In other words, there are other countries, of course, that we don't think of within the terms of American exceptionalism. It could be Britain, it could be other countries, that does have some regulation of speech. Does that mean that they won't have a Weimar moment? Of course not. Does that mean that the extreme right or the whatever it is won't take over? Of course not. But the question is, how essential are these things? Is the total free speech expression to this democracy at this time? I appreciate your saying more than ever. Mm-hmm. I don't know that. So before we go, we move forward with asking that question, um, I'd like to turn it over to Chris real quick. Muted. To whom? Chris Finan. Boris, sorry. <laughs> Ignore the basic role of Zoom there. Um, I want to thank Randall and, and Martin for um, delineating these arguments so clearly and, and thoughtfully. And um, this is the kind of conversation that uh, NCAC is committed to continuing. This is the second uh, uh, luncheon that we've had this year. We're going to continue to do more. And all I'm gonna ask right now is that those of you who thought this was an important um, contribution to, uh, to consider visiting ncac.org and um, making a donation. Thanks, Emily. So a lot of the questions that we're receiving are really going to this point, which is still how do we move 
forward? What, who should have the say over what shows up, especially for example, in the marketplace of ideas? Does even that concept of a marketplace of ideas make any sense when we have platforms where one person's idea can be sent out to billions of people. And I think um, this idea that free speech was supposed to be protected by the police, um, for those of us who aren't located in the United States, this is actually how Amendment 19 and Amendments, uh, Article 19 and Article 7 of the UN Declaration of Human Rights were supposed to work together. Um, I guess I will move again and say, um, where should we go from here thinking about um, how one person's speech can be amplified across the globe? And what sort of responses should we have on both a legal level and on a societal level to speech that we find to be harmful? Randall has the answer. <laughs> I, I, I wish. On the, on, the, on, the, on the question of, you know, what do we do about some people being able to amplify their voices so much? And then, you know, other people, you know, yeah, you're free to speak, but, you know, you're free to speak, but, you know, you, three people are going to hear you. You know, what, what, what do we do about that? You know, frankly, I... I don't know, and there's a part of me that thinks that um, it's always going to be the case that some people, you know, have more sway, have more of a platform than other people. I mean, you know, a million people are going to follow, you know, Jay Z and Beyonce or for that matter, Barack Obama. Uh, you know, and there are gonna be a lot more people that follow those folks than follow, you know, some, you know, I don't care, pick out the most distinguished uh, law professor expert on the First Amendment. Um, those folks are gonna be, you know, are gonna have more of a platform than, the, than, the, than this, you know, hypothesized teacher. Okay. I mean, you know, I, I, that that's that's true. That's the way it is. You know, question: How much of a problem really is that? Um, you know, I I I I I do think that we ought to continue to appreciate the preciousness of people and individual on up, an individual and organization, the preciousness of people being able to think out loud. And, you know, that is a very precious thing and actually a relatively new thing in much of the world. Again, you know, I think we sort of often take that for granted, we ought not. And while we're thinking about the difficulties involved in, you know, other concerns, you know, what, what, about, what about egalitarianism in the, you know, in the domain of freedom of expression? I, I think that's, you know, I'm, good, interesting subject, needs thought, need to think about it. But at base, at base, the idea of protecting the right of people to think and to get thought seems to me that, you know, to attain thought, receive thought, that it seems to me is central. We ought not be um, defensive about that. 
we ought be actually militant defenders of that basic thing, really? that basic idea, that basic habit, that basic right, that basic power. Um, at, at least at that, at this moment, um, defending that community of, of thinking sentiment is, 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 is where my energies are and frankly, what I want to communicate. I think, just going back for a second, I think censorship can easily lead to fascism. I think censorship with an effective police force, you know, we've talked about a lot of these things, can also lead to fascism. I also think that the ability to spread lies mm -hmm. and the ability to hurt people is at a different point in our culture now. And that concerns me. And it seems to me to say that all the principles that Randall and I have spent our lives believing in and agreeing on, the question is how do we facilitate those principles better than we do today? And that's a very complicated thing because once you try to stop lies, you're stopping speech. Uh, and we recognize, I recognize that balance. Well, we, once you, well, let's look, you know, once you try to stop lies, you know, a couple things. One, we ought never forget that, you know, are there boundaries? I'm not saying that they're not, you know, yeah, there are boundaries. Sure, there are boundaries. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's against the law and it is properly against the law for someone to go up to another person and, you know, threaten to kill them. Uh, there, you know, there's, there's, there's a variety of ways in which what we might view, you know, what we, we properly view as speech is you know bounded. Um, if you you know, we have libel laws, so there are various ways in which certain speech acts are put beyond the pale, and I, I'm you know, and I'm okay with that. I think though that what generated this you know, what, what generated a call for, you know, this discussion, and I think what, what inch, you know, what's sort of agitating people is a feeling that, um, or at least, you know, agitating some folks is a feeling that we're not being, a, you know, that people like me, people like me are not being attentive enough to um, a sense by other folks of feeling hurt, that people like me are not being attentive enough to people who feel that, you know, groups with which they are affiliated are being defamed. I was reading yesterday for purposes of a, you know, completely different project. I was reading um, James Foreman's Black Manifesto. You know, he, he, he unveiled this in 1969. And I, I, I was rereading it. I hadn't read it in a long, long time. But one of the things that James Foreman wanted in his Black Manifesto, you know, he wanted $500 million from, you know, uh, uh, the churches and synagogues in the United States for reparations. And one of the things that he wanted to do with the money was to create a uh, African American anti-defamation league. And I remember marking down in the, in the uh, margins of my book, I'm glad that that did not happen. Um, I think that, you know, but, but there are a lot of people who disagree with me on that. And, you know, there is a feeling of, 
Randall, so, excuse me, why yeah. not? Other groups have anti-defamation. Leaders. Yeah, and I'm not, and it's fine. And, you know, and, and, you know, and as far as I'm concerned, I, you know, there's a, there's a good bit about what they say and do with which I disagree. Right. I don't think that, I don't think, I think it was a, you know, uh, the, 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 the question of hurt feelings so in this discussion, and, 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 and Emily, to go back to, you know, your, your scenario, I, I've, I've had scenarios like that, you know, again, where I am. And one of the things that I say that generates the most opposition and, frankly, anger when I get in these discussions with, you know, with, with, with colleagues and with students, you know, harm. So for me, I think that a lot of folks are all too um, unwilling to probe the question of harm. Somebody says that, you know, what you said has harmed me. You know, I, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sort of accept that at face value, frankly. Um, I wanna know. Well, what is it? I want to know. I want to ask the question of, are you, are you feeling justifiably harmed? Is your feeling of harm justifiable? Because, you know, I mean, if, if you simply say that you feel harmed, you know, if I give a speech about the greatness of Martin Luther King Jr., and then somebody comes up after the speech and says that, you know, they feel harmed, and then they let me know that they're, a, you know, a believer in white supremacy. And because I've talked about the greatness of Martin Luther King Jr., they feel, you know, they, they feel harmed. You know, my attitude is, well, you know, you feel harmed, but, you know, that's, that's you know, am, am, am I supposed to apologize for that? No. Actually, your feeling of harm is, you know, unjustifiable and you need to do some work on yourself. So I, I, I think, I think, and I think with respect to these issues, and discussions. This discussion too, um, we need to work on really discussing things and really you know, putting everything on the table. I think a lot of the harm language, as far as I'm concerned, I'm very skeptical um, about it. I wanna talk about it. But I think everything ought to be talked about. So I think that is a great discussion that we should have in the future. Um, I'm very curious to see what will come out of the cheerleader case, since it actually is in some ways overdetermined and really brings together harm, uh, speech, social media, education, mm. all together in one, and seeing what the Supreme Court will say on that particular ruling, I think is very important. I'd like to thank Randall and Martin for this wonderful discussion today. I hope we will have many more in the future. And I'd like to turn it over to Chris. And so I add my thanks to Randall and, and Martin and also Emily. Um, and just one last reminder, um, if you think this was a valuable conversation, please stop by ncac.org and make a donation. Thanks for being here.